Good morning, Building D. How are we doing today? It's great to be with you live today. I want to say good morning to Southwest Campus, Dripping Springs Campus, and also Building A as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. We started this series a few weeks ago. We're going to be in this series until about mid-July. And um, <clears throat> these first few chapters of 1 Corinthians are the easy ones. You hit about chapter 5, it's going to feel like a 2 by 4 like we talked about. But we're just kind of building up momentum to hit to those, some, some of those chapters. But the theology that Paul's laying out here in the first few chapters is hugely important for us to understand as a church. Uh, today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about what Christians believe and how that's perceived by people who do not follow Christ. And what I mean by that is this, that I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up going to church. Some of you did not grow up in Christian homes. You may not have grown up going to church. But there can easily become this whole lingo or even lifestyle of Christians and things we say that we wouldn't say otherwise. Like using the word ye, like who uses Y-E in a sentence? But Christians will start using the word ye when they start talking about Christian things. Well, we do things that may not make sense to other people around us. And, and honestly, when I was growing up, I used to think that Christians were the freakiest, craziest, strangest nut jobs in the world. And some of you may be here today and you're not a believer and you're thinking, I still feel the same way. And, and I, I understand that because sometimes you can be saying things as a Christian and even while you're saying it, you're going, this probably sounds completely crazy to whoever I'm talking to. This is, even as a pastor, I preach for a living and sometimes I'm in the middle of my message and I'm talking, I'm thinking, this has got to sound totally crazy right now, what we're talking about. But we believe it, we believe it's true and God's used it to change our lives. So as, as, as I was growing up, I remember people would come and try to share Christ with us. And sometimes they would say strange things. They would say things like, are you saved? And, and someone who didn't grow up in church, they had saved from what? I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, have you trusted Jesus? And you're thinking, well, I, what does it mean to trust Jesus? Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus, and, and think about this. You're saying stuff like, Jesus was God but he became man, he was fully man, fully God, all at the same time, he was never not God, but he was also never not fully man when he was incarnated, there's another word we would use, and someone's going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, and oh, by the way, he died on the cross to save you from your sins. And then he died, and he was resurrected, rose on the third day to walk, okay, so dead people are now walking, that's right. Oh, and by the way, he was born to a virgin. She was probably about 14 or 15 years old. Oh, great, we have virgin moms in the Bible as well. And you're listening to this thing, and this sounds nuts. I remember being in a restroom one time. And don't ever put tracks in a restroom. I remember being in a restroom, and a track comes under the door. I don't know if you ever had that happen before. And I remember looking at the track, it was on the ground, it said, do you want to go to hell? I was like, no, I don't want to go to hell right now. I want to use the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm thinking, maybe in hell there's not tracks. Maybe that's the one good thing about hell, right? And you're sitting there thinking, this is so strange. Like your neighbors probably wonder, where do they go every Sunday morning? Have you ever not come to church? I know not, nobody in this room. But have you ever not attended church and you're out on a Sunday morning, you're going, oh my gosh. There's like this whole world happening out here that's not going to church. And this, this, is, this is odd to people at times. And, and sometimes we can feel like this sounds crazy. I remember talking to a non-Christian one time, and he had never been to church in his life, and he was going to come to Austin Ridge. He said, so do y'all have, like, uniforms you wear? Or, or, and, and I just thought the question was great because he was totally clueless. He's like, do I have to wear one of those bracelets that says, like, what would Jesus do? And do I need to throw my music out? Do I, do I get a bumper sticker to put on the car? And it just at times, it gets odd. I think the Corinthian church was struggling with some of the same things. To remind you, the Corinthian church, they were young, hip, they were cool, they were good looking, they were powerful, they were wealthy, they were affluent. Austin is Corinth. And these were folks who had not grown up in church. These were folks who, a few years ago, they were worshiping false gods. And now all of a sudden, they've come to Christ and they're starting to struggle with what God says and what people say. Is it possible that we may struggle with some of the same things sometimes. Here's what the Bible says authoritatively, but here's what our culture here in Corinth is also saying. And they started struggling with who to go with, if you will. Martin Luther talked about 1 Corinthians in this way. He said that there's two categories of people in 1 Corinthians. There's those that have glory in, in, in the cross, 
and there's those that have a true theology of the cross. And I started reading more. Okay, what is Martin Luther talking about? He's saying this. Those who have a theology of glory is that Jesus is here to make my life better. He's here to make me affluent. He's here to make me successful. He's here to make sure my kids are healthy. They go to the right colleges. They make the right money. I have the right money. I have the right portfolio. That the glory of the cross is that I'll never have any problems as long as I follow Jesus. But there's also a theology of the cross that says this, that Jesus died broke. He died humble. He was a servant. He, he was what we would call today homeless. He, he had friends betray him. And so when you look at these two different pictures of Jesus, there's the Jesus that our culture loves. He is the greatest self-help, self-help program in the world. He can make your life better. And then there's this Jesus of the Bible that says, you know what, if you follow me, you're gonna have to take up your cross daily. Like everything is not gonna go smooth. Matter of fact, when you start following me, things are going to start happening that are not fun. You're gonna have friends that don't wanna associate with you anymore. You're gonna struggle. You're gonna have something for the first time in your life called conviction. Things that used to not bother you start to bother you. God starts moving in your heart. I can remember as a freshman at Clemson University, started reading my Bible because God started moving my heart. And there was one day, I remember distinctly the day, I was walking up this hill to go to class and it just hit me, I love Jesus. Like, I actually love Jesus now. It's not just going to church. It's not just about my parents or, or, or being a Baptist or whatever it is. I love Jesus. Like, he is the most important thing in my life. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a certain moment on a certain day. I can't explain that to you. But God's spirit starts working in your heart and he starts to change you. And so Paul is gonna talk about this theology of the cross and how the Bible teaches it versus how the world sees it. And honestly, the world sees the cross as foolishness. It's silly, it's crazy. Look with me at verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly. That means silly. Crazy to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, and you'll notice there in verse 19, your Bible is indented, it's in parentheses, it's from an Old Testament passage. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Another way of saying, I will destroy. That to the world, the word of the cross is crazy talk. But for the Christian, it is literally the most important single event in the history of the world. That little Old Testament passage he refers to, it goes back to Isaiah. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is talking to Israel. Israel is about to be attacked. The northern kingdom is about to be attacked by the Assyrian army, one of the nastiest people ever to live on the face of the planet. These were mean, uh, brutal people. And, and, and Isaiah is pleading with the Israelites, cry out to God to help you. Cry out to God to protect you. But what do they do? They want to cry out to the Egyptians, the world's way, the world's power, and we want the Egyptians to come help us. They cry out to the Egyptians instead of God, and the northern kingdom gets conquered by the Assyrians. Oh, by the way, the Egyptians also got conquered by the Assyrians as well. Another way of saying that is this. There is nothing on this planet that ultimately will satisfy your deepest needs outside of the cross of Jesus Christ. But to the world, it seems foolish. For us, the cross is, that's where Jesus revealed himself as the payment of our sin. It's where the mercy of God is seen. It's where his holiness is demonstrated. It's where God the Father's wrath was taken care of once and for all. That is where God conquered Satan, sin, death, and the demonic realm, on the cross. Paul says when you come to the cross, some people find that crazy talk. But for Christians, it's the most glorious, most anchoring truth in all of Scripture. So we're going to have two people that we're going to interact with in our worlds. We're going to have folks who get the cross and folks who don't get the cross. You're going to have folks who are Jesus followers and those who are not Jesus followers. And you have family and friends that don't follow Jesus. 
and you witness to them and you pray for them and you try to live the life in front of them and you're wondering why don't they get it? It's not because they're not as smart as you. It's because they are blinded. The Bible says in Romans 1 where Paul talks about this, he says they are unwilling because they suppress the truth. In unrighteousness. The issue is not revelation. The issue is my will does not want to bend to the revelation. So what I will do is I will suppress the revelation of God. And I will pretend as if I'm God. And so we suppress it. Here's the truth. The Bible says that Jesus is humble. People don't want to be humble. So they suppress it. The Bible says that Jesus was without sin. We like to sin, so we suppress it. The Bible say that Jesus is loving, but we love ourselves more than everyone else, so we will suppress it, and so we resist the truth. I saw an interesting quote this past week by a non-believer, H.G. Wells. Here's what he said. I thought this was interesting. He says, I am an historian. I'm not a believer, but I must confess as an historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. That's at least a non-Jesus following person admitting, I don't believe, but you can't say that that was just another guy. You can't say it's just another religious leader. And I remember again when I started reading my Bible and I started saying, God, would you change me that the Spirit of God started convicting me of things I used to do. I imagine if I said this morning, do you remember when you were a non-Christian? Would you come up and tell us about that? Most of us would not want to do that. Most of us would not bring photos up to the stage and say, let me show you what life was like without Jesus. We wouldn't bring receipts to talk about what we did and how we spent our money. And Paul is saying to these folks here, do you remember? He's going to say, do you remember before you, before you became a believer? Do you remember the foolishness of this? And the very thing that is our anchor has become foolishness to the world. I was um, in South Carolina a few years back, and I was meeting with some old high school friends, which is always weird. And so I'm sitting there with some high school friends. I hadn't seen them in 25 years probably. And I'm sitting there, and one of the guys, he looks at me, he goes, I've heard what you do for a living. I was like, great, because you never know what's, what, what's going to happen when you say, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, and then you, you don't know what's going to happen. He said, said, yeah, I'm a pastor. He goes, he paused, do you handle snakes? <laughs> I thought, not at the pulpit at least. To him, what I do is nuts. Like, what do you mean you're a pastor? Do you handle snakes? There was another guy at the table. We walked out of the restaurant. He came up to me. He said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. And he goes, I want you to know that a few years ago, I gave my life to Jesus. I went through a horrible divorce. My wife left me. I was broken. I was in the lowest point of my life, and Jesus changed my life. And a tear started coming down his face. Two different people in the same conversation, one sees it as nuts, and one sees it as it is my very anchor of life, it is my very source of strength. Jesus is my all in all. Some people get it, some people won't. What's the difference? The difference is God has opened up your heart to truth. You weren't smarter. Have you ever been, you remember uh, kickball elementary school, remember? I don't know if you remember that far back. Some of you are old. Remember? (laughs) And you'd pick teams, remember that? Who always got picked first? I never got picked last, so I don't know what that's like, but I've heard it's bad. You, you would always, you would always pick like the biggest kid, the strongest kid, the most athletic kid, and then it's the most brutal thing in the world. You pick this guy, I take that guy, I take that girl, I take that girl, I take that guy, and there's always one scrawny kid left, right? It's the worst thing in the world. Here's what Paul's gonna tell you in this text. Don't get arrogant to think that you're a little smarter than everybody else. God chose you and you were unchoosable. You were last. You were the scrawny kid. You have nothing to boast about. You weren't smarter. You weren't beautiful. Most of us did not come from noble backgrounds. And so the cross for us, why would we trade the cross for the culture's theology? Why would we trade a Mercedes for a skateboard, a Ferrari for a Vespa? We have the Cadillac. We have it all. I love what Martin Luther said about this. He said, following the world's clever ideas is like riding a horse drunk. I love Martin Luther. 
Sooner or later, that horse is going to figure out you're drunk, and he's going to knock you off. When I start thinking about the world's theology, the cleverness of the clever, God says here in verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. All the theologies in the world will come to a big fat zero one day before the Lord himself. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. I'm going to read several verses here. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? That would have been the Greek. Love to debate truth. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach. To save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly, craziness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I love these verses. To the folks who are not following Jesus, this stuff is nuts. To those who follow Jesus, this is our life. This past week here at Austin Ridge, we had several tragic situations happen in families. It was a, it was a tough week for our body. And I've watched people get phone calls from the doctor. And I've watched people take the news, you have three months to live. I sat with a man of our church Friday. He was told a few months to live three years ago. He's still living. To watch a Christian get that call is drastically different than seeing a non-believer get that call. My wife and I were watching TV the other night. Yes, your pastor does watch TV at times. And we're watching TV, and on this program, there's a funeral. And the person died. When you hear non-Christians talk about death and what they want for a funeral, it is nuts. They have, they have nothing to say. It is we have no hope now. It's over. Like when you die, it's done. But you go to a, a funeral of a Christian, maybe here at Austin Ridge, and you see people cry, but there is joy and there is laughter and there is hope and there are stories of faith being taught. That's because life for that person has just now begun. But when your theology comes from the world, your life ends and that's it as far as your hope is concerned. Another way of saying that is this. If you're not a Jesus follower, this world's as good as it gets for you. If you are a Christ follower, this world is as bad as it's ever gonna get for you. That there is a hope past death, and that is foolishness to the world. So the Jewish person says, I gotta see miracles. Show me signs. The Jewish person was like this. We have the Torah, we have the law of God, but we want Jesus to change the water into wine. We want to see Jesus walk on the water. We want to see miracles. We want proof. God kept sending prophets, prophets, prophets. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. That's great and everything, but we want to see miracles. Some of us treat Jesus like the Jewish people do. God, I love you as long as you answer all my questions. God, I love you if you answer all my questions with the right answers that I want to hear. God, I love you as long as you take care of my family and do A, B, and C. It's a, it's a glory of the cross. It's not a theology of the cross. I love Jesus as long as he does what I want him to do. For some of you, you had a hard time coming to Christ because, do we have any engineers in the room? Any engineers? Several engineers. Engineers struggle coming to Christ. Would you agree with me? Because engineers are so logical. Like everything's gotta make sense Everything's got to be drawn right. It's got to, if A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. Engineers struggle more. And I love my engineer friends who are Jesus followers because they get it that this is about faith. Like there are some things I don't understand and I'm going to have to be okay with that. I want you to know that God's infinite wisdom does not stop at my finite intellect. That just because I don't understand something, just because I don't have the answers does not mean that it's wrong or God doesn't know what he's doing. Matter of fact, the older I get, the more I read my Bible, the more questions I have. But I've also learned this as I get older. The wise is not my business. 
God's business is the why. My business is to be faithful in the what. So sometimes I sit with Christians who are going through tragedy, and you think, what do you say to those people at that point? I don't say anything. I just sit with them because we have the same anchor. I can look at them and say, we don't have any answers, but we know the one who does, right? We don't know what tomorrow's gonna hold. We know who holds tomorrow. We know that this life is not it, and we know there's more to come, and we know that person that we love, they're not in that casket. They're not in that grave. They are with their king. They are home, and true life has begun, and one day we'll be with them again, but for now, we're gonna be faithful, and we're gonna be sad. We're gonna get down. We're gonna shed tears, but there is an inner hope and peace that nothing on this planet can shake. That is foolishness to this world because they don't understand it. Earthly philosophy becomes bankrupt generation after generation after generation on this planet. I remember back in the 60s and the 70s, remember Janis Joplin, she had an ideology of life. She died of a drug overdose. Jimi Hendrix died of a drug overdose. Jim Morrison, he had an ideology of life. He died. I remember when Frederick Nietzsche said that God is dead, and I remember there was a sign that said God is dead and it had Nietzsche's signature on the bottom, and then someone penciled in, you're dead, sign God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's pretty good. Because in this culture, a generation comes up with their own thought. Where is the ideology of the 60s? The 80s took it over. Praise the Lord, the 80s got taken over, right? But as Christians, we don't look to the world for wisdom. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't be scholarly. I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't be smart and they shouldn't study. Here's what I'm saying. Your education should lead you to Jesus. Your sociology should lead you to Jesus. Your psychology should lead you to Jesus. Your scholarship should lead you to Jesus. Because only this planet could be a planet that would say, we don't like there to be any creator, so we'll create a theory that takes even more faith. We don't like the fact that there's a book that's authoritative, the very word of God, so we'll create more religious books. We don't like the fact that God is on the throne. We want him to be our personal self-help aid, but we don't want him to be Lord because that would take a cross. So when Jesus says, if you're gonna follow me, you must take up your cross, how often? Daily is not something the world wants to hear. The world wants Jesus to stay in his lane, as we would say in our culture. Just stay in your lane and do what you're supposed to do and be a good deity, and I'll make sure I throw some money at you to keep you happy. Human beings have birthdays. If you have birthdays, you can't write a book that starts in the beginning God created. That has to be divine revelation. So Paul is saying, you can take your Scientology, you can take your pantheism, you can take your new spiritualities, and God says it all ends up as a zero. You follow me, church? Look with me at verse 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So what you do is you start the cross and you say, what is this about and what does it say about me? Maybe it's not about being rich and powerful and strong and beautiful. Maybe it's about serving. Maybe it's not about me having all my questions answered. Maybe it's about me submitting. What Luther calls the theology of glory gets absolutely destroyed at the cross of Christ. And so you have two choices. You either begin with human speculation and you end up with what the world can provide you and that changes every generation or you start with divine revelation and you get what only God can provide and the earth may come and go and it will not change your hope. What Paul is not denigrating, he's not denigrating philosophers and scholars and students. He's saying that it should lead Jesus. Whenever you go to college, you ask people, what are you majoring in? There's three majors that you always say, what are you gonna do with that? You ready? English, what are you gonna do with that? You gonna teach? History, what are you gonna do with that? You gonna teach? Psychology, what are you going to do with that? You're going to teach? That, those are the three. I think Christians should go into these fields, but I think it should lead them to Jesus, not away from Jesus. I love what uh, John MacArthur said about this. He said, Christians don't need psychology because if psychology speaks truth, then you go to your Bible and it's there. If psychology doesn't teach you truth, you don't want it because it's deceptive, so you go back to your Bible and it's there. 
we should have the greatest psychology and the greatest sociology and the greatest scholarship because we have the truth who became a man who died for us and rose again so that where I am, you may be there when? Also. Soon. I love how the Bible ends. Come, Lord Jesus, come. I was thinking that this past week. Lord, just come on, right? You ever have weeks like that? Just, I mean, my son Luke had a horrible week. He was off. Friday night he went to bed at 4 a.m. He was up till 4 a.m., can't go to sleep. And I'm like, come, Lord Jesus, come. But I gotta preach Sunday. I can't wait for Jesus to come back because I don't have to preach anymore. No more preaching in heaven, amen? You're thinking, amen, I don't have to listen to you anymore. That's awesome. (laughs) Verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. By the way, a calling, is that initiated by you or someone else? That's an initiated by someone else. It has nothing to do with you. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Paul says, think about what you were like before you were a Christian. There's not, there's not that there's no smart Christians, but most of us are just driving beater cars and eating hamburgers and hitting the snooze button. A few of y'all might have gone to Ivy League. I know some of you are very smart. You went to Ivy League schools, right? Most of us were just hoping to get into tech. Like, I can't even understand high school physics. I have no idea what that's about. I just skipped physics. I just went around it. Can't do it. But then we're going to look at God and we're going to say, God, you're doing this wrong? God's thinking, I made the universe and you, you struggle making a sandwich? And you're going to tell me I don't know what I'm doing right now in your life? Can you imagine how arrogant that comes across to the deity who it says sits on his throne from everlasting to everlasting. The currency demanded by Christianity is not brilliance. It is brokenness in a sense of our guilt and we don't try to dodge it with our own man-made brilliance. And the culture historically that has tried to invent truth apart from God has become an archeological dig site. How many Assyrians do you see now? Know any Assyrians? Archaeological dig sites. Let's continue, verse 27. But God, I love those but God statements in the Bible. But God chose what is foolish, that's us, in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. I think these verses are important for us to remember that it's not that we're smarter, it's just that God chose to love us. That God looked down on me and didn't think, I gotta have that guy on my team. He thought, no one's gonna pick that guy on his team. And I'm gonna choose to love that kid out of mercy and out of pity. And he chose to love me. God's not impressed with us. We're impressed with ourselves, but God's not impressed with us. We're, I'm looking around building D. Most of us are unimpressive looking human beings, <laughs> right? We're just kind of normal everyday people. Now, every once in a while, Christianity, they, they, we do have some smart people, right? I mean, every once in a while, we get a famous person like Bono. So we got one. We got Bono. He's cool, right? But you could take all the cool Christians and put them in a phone booth, and they could have their fellowship because there's not many. Most of us are just normal, everyday people. Stress, worry, financial issues, raising kids, paying a mortgage, And we're just hoping that God is all the things he is. And I'm telling you, biblically speaking, theologically speaking, experientially speaking, he is more than you can imagine. Verse 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God, look what I did. Look at what I pulled off. Aren't you lucky to have me on your team? No. God says, you were not impressive. I found you. I changed you. I sanctified you, I redeemed you, and one day I'll glorify you. I initiated all of this. So when someone comes and says, I'm amazed you're going through this so amazingly, this tough time, you think, you know what? You should have seen before Jesus. I would not have done it this way. It's all because of Jesus. He's changed my life. That's the only reason I'm responding the way I'm responding. That's the only reason I'm not reacting the way I would have reacted. That's the only reason I'm not attacking the way I would have attacked. If you'd have known me before Jesus, you wouldn't recognize me. I'm a totally different person. Verse 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Those are 
big words, but what it's saying is your past penalty of sin has been taken care of. You've been justified. Your present power of sin is being dealt with. You're being sanctified. And one day you'll be fully redeemed. You'll be glorified. And the presence of sin will be taken care of. The greatest part about heaven for me that I can't wait for is I will be incapable of ever sinning again. Amen? That I won't have to mess with this flesh anymore. I won't have to struggle with lust or greed or selfishness. I won't have to manipulate. I'll actually have a relationship with the people that are completely pure and completely spiritual. But for now, we're going to struggle. Verse 31, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. Which means this, church, we're no better than anybody else. That you and I are big fat sinners just like everybody else. We weren't smarter. God just decided to change our hearts. Why did he change my heart and not someone else's? I have no idea, but I'm so glad he did. My job is to be faithful in front of all of those hearts. My job is to pray for those hearts. My job is to love those hearts. If at any point Christians forget their sinners, they were saved by grace through faith, it's not us, but it's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast, then we become arrogant, boastful Christians who lose sight of the cross, which means we're losing sight of Jesus. You know, back in the time of Paul, people were not, it was not appropriate to talk about the cross in general conversations. It was such an obscene, horrific place of execution. Roman citizens couldn't even be executed by a crucifixion. You had to be a Gentile to be executed by a crucifixion or a non-Roman citizen. And yet now we, at times, we'll put it on jewelry, earrings. But I want to bring an understanding of what the cross is for us. You can have it on jewelry, and that's fine, but here's the deal. It is not a token it is not a form of art. It is the place of our redemption. It is the place where we are saved. It is the place where God's wrath was taken care of so that I don't have to pay that price. Someone died a death I could never die so that I can live a life I would have never have lived. That is what the cross is. I've had people at times say, you know, we talk about the cross a lot. It's kind of boring me. It should never bore us. It should never get old. He's been so good to me. Hasn't God been good to you? Has God been faithful to you? It doesn't mean you're not going through pain. But he took away our sin at the cross. He took away our shame. He took away the disgrace. He's given me new life. Amen? I was thinking this week, I want to close with some words from one of my favorite hymns. Isaac Watts, 1748, when I survey the wondrous cross, and I was going to sing this to you, but I'm not. Just listen to these words. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose such a rich a crown? Oh, the wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross. Bids me come and what? Die. And find that I may truly what? Live. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, all who gather here by grace draw near and bless your name. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were an amazing far, offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. A proper theology of the cross demands my soul, my life, my all. The cross gives us insider trading on life. Insider trading means this, that I've got some chips on the table and I'm putting all my chips on Jesus. I'm all in. I love to see people become all in at Austin Ridge. I love to see, I've said this before, I love it when somebody starts coming, they're new, the music starts, it's just weird to them. Like, why do we sing? And then all of a sudden over time, I start seeing a little... A little toe tap that starts right there. Okay. And all of a sudden, I start seeing their mouth mumble some words. And all of a sudden, you may see a hand come up. 
Don't want to be too crazy. And their life changes. And you see all the deceptive philosophy of the world flushed out. And it's renewed and refreshed and replaced by the theology of the cross. And then you start to realize how thankful we are that we get to live any days. And that God doesn't owe us anything. Yesterday I got to do something I never do on Saturdays. I went and played golf because I heard the cedar count was high, so I wanted to get out. <laughs> Actually, cedar's the only thing I don't struggle with. The other 10 months out of the year, I struggle with everything. So I was playing golf yesterday. And... I was playing golf with a buddy, and I was thinking how great it is that we get to be outside today and walking around. A lot of people can't be out walking around. That there'll be a point in my life where I won't be able to play golf. There'll be a point in my life I won't be able to walk down a fairway or in the woods with my buddy's ball. (laughs) There'll be a point in life where it will hurt more to get out of bed than it ever should. There'll be a point where things start aching. It's already started for me. There'll be a point where some of my friends won't be around anymore. There'll be a point where I'm not doing funerals for older people. I'm doing funerals for people my age. And there'll be a point where I'm doing funerals for people that are younger than I am. There'll be a point where the glimmer of this earth has been lost. And I just don't want it anymore. There'll be a point where I just want to go home. Until that day, saint, be faithful. Enjoy today. Get you a Snicker bar. Get you a Dr. Pepper. Enjoy the spouse that God's given you. Enjoy the kids that God's given you. Enjoy the job that God's given you. And enjoy today because tomorrow he may call us home. And until that day, may we be found faithful. Amen, church? Because we have a proper theology of the cross. Lord, today, we are grateful that we get to live right now. That right now, there is an understanding that I got to stand here for one more morning and be with my friends. There was one more morning where I get to open the Bible and say, thus saith the Lord. There's one more morning that we get to sing and we get to have fellowship in the foyer And we get to say hey to friends. And Father, there are things that happen, some things that happen in our body this week that we don't understand. But we trust you. We know you're good. We know you never waste pain. And we know that you're in charge. And so Father, we don't see you as someone we need to direct. We see you as the one that we have to kneel to that we want to submit to the sovereign one who holds everything in the palm of his hand and who has created both earth and sky. Father, may we be a people of great joy because of the cross and of great humility. It's in the glorious and beautiful and majestic name of Jesus we pray. Amen.